Happy Groundhog Day, everyone. Um, I've heard from students that our faculty have high standards. Is that true? Great expectations. Is that true, students? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can tell you they have very high standards in how they evaluate each other. To win the respect of a faculty, you have to be a really good teacher. To win the Lindbeck Award, you have to be a great teacher. And I have the pleasure of introducing our Lindbeck Award winner this year for distinguished teaching, Professor of Mathematics, Annalisa Cornell. A self-proclaimed math geek, Professor Cornell earned her undergraduate degree from Bryn Mawr College and her MA and PhD in mathematics from Brown mm -hmm. University. Her research focuses on applications of projected geometry to perspective art. Since arriving at F&M in 1992, she has taught a broad variety of courses in math and has created a rich array of general education and interdisciplinary courses. Her course, Mathematics and Art, led to a series of workshops for teachers in a highly regarded book, Viewpoints, Mathematical Perspective, and Fractal Geometry and Art. Professor Cornell has lectured all over the United States on writing in mathematics classroom and on mathematics and art. In addition to the Lindback Award, she is the recipient of many other awards, including the prestigious Hamo Distinguished Teaching Award by the Mathematical Association of America in 2008. Always an innovator, she has seemingly inexhaustible energy and an inherent desire to improve not only the learning experience of our students, but the lives of others as well. In her talk today, Professor Cornell will explore how her time at Franklin and Marshall College has changed her own view of worldly concerns, as well as how a bit of simple geometry has helped her and others understand how to look at art and to see it truly in a whole new way. Please join me in welcoming Professor Annalisa Cornell. Thank you so much. Oh, that's great. Um, hello, it's gonna come back up, I'm assuming. Yeah, okay, it's good. So hello to my students, to my colleagues on the staff and the faculty, to, um, to my neighbors from the Lancaster community who come to a common hour so often. It's really wonderful that we get to share this common scholarly journey together every week. It's really, it's, it's great. I'd also like to welcome some people who aren't normally here at Common Hour. My father and his wife, my sisters are here, my children, well, many of my children, not all of them. My granddaughter, my husband is here. Um, me, here we go. Um, members of my church, Wheatland Presbyterian Church. My running buddies are here. Um, also some of my fellow breakfast line servers from Water Street Rescue Mission, who do such incredibly good work here in the city for people who really need it. Um, for me, I'm just thrilled to have so many important pieces of my life all in the room together. This is great. My talk today is going to have two parts. The second part is um, the part that you probably thought I would be talking about, which is the mathematics of art. So I will talk about how do we get this wonderful three-dimensional world that we live in and put it onto a two-dimensional canvas? And in particular, we'll be talking about these sheets, so if you find one near you or you can share one with somebody near you towards the end of the talk, this will actually be really helpful. But the first part of my talk is actually going to be a long and extended set of thank yous. Um, and by long, I mean like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, um, where I'll be taking advantage of the fact that this is our common hour to tell stories about some of the people that we here have in common. Um, yeah, and part of the reason that I'm telling stories has to do with a book discussion group that I have gone to that's been running for about 30 years now, originally organized by um, Ira Fite, a professor in the biology department. This is called the Evolution Table. At one of these discussions that I went to, another professor of French, Lisa Gasparoni, said, um, she said, evolution by selection is a narrative. I heard that and I said, how ridiculous. Evolution by selection is not just a narrative, it's a scientific theory that has predictive value. But Professor Gasparoni said, no, no, no. As human beings, everything about the way we make sense about the world is narrative. Everything is narrative. And the more that I've lived with this idea that she had, the more I've come to 
understand my own life. This way, this, this narrative has shaped the way I teach my classes, and it's also shaping the way I'm giving today's talk. So my first talk, my first story today, starts the day that I heard that I got tenure here at FNM. Um, to celebrate, I went out and I bought a banjo. Before that, the only musical instrument I knew how to play was a radio, which is really different. Um, so how do you learn to play a banjo? Who on campus do you go to? Well, I went to the people on campus who know how to do everything. That is, I went to facilities and operations. So here's me um, playing banjo. A couple of mathematicians are watching with a groundskeeper named Boots Miles. He was a really great guy. Um, I remember at one point I was having real trouble learning how to make a chord. I could not make this chord. It was impossible. And I asked him, like, how do I make my fingers do this? And he said, practice. And I thought, how ridiculous. I cannot practice it if it's impossible in the first place. And he said, no, just keep practicing. Um, so I kept practicing the impossible, and eventually it became possible. I think this was a really great lesson in humility as well as in um, learning to play the banjo for somebody who was newly tenured, and I'm really grateful to him. Part of the reason that I'm starting with this story about boots and about facilities and operations is often we start common hour by saying thank you to our sponsors and saying thank you to the pizza servers, but I also really wanted to say thank you to the people who set up our chairs and take them down and who make our campus so incredibly beautiful. <laughs> Um, as an epilogue, Boots Miles, the guy who taught me to play banjo, is also the guy who um, developed this herbaceous FNM that's on the side of the, our science building. And if you see, there's a plaque off to the side. That's a plaque dedicated to Boots. Um, so my second story actually starts the day after I heard I got tenure, which is like, you know, big yay hooray day. And people come by and say, like, how does it feel? Which is a weird, very weird question. Um, but one of the people who came by was a professor of American studies. Professor Stevens came by my office to say congratulations, and she said, you know, when I got tenure, I didn't feel any different, but people treated me differently. And that comment stuck with me, not because of the way it feels to have tenure, but because for me it was another really interesting and very concrete example of the way our circumstances affect people's perceptions of us. And I've thought about that a lot over the years. Um, I've been really grateful to a lot of other people who've helped me unpack that notion. I want to shrink this down just a little bit. They're great people. Um, but so, yeah, we don't need the DVD player. OK, this is going to be a very interactive production. OK, so I want to say particularly thank you to Stephanie McNulty for organizing the Day of Dialogue. Um, I've also been incredibly um, fortunate to have in my life Donnell Butler and Ashley Rondini, um, Danelle Butler is the dean of, I don't even remember your title, of many important things, um, and doing wonderful stuff on campus. And Ashley Rondini is a professor in the sociology department. Both of them have really helped me understand the context and vocabulary for this really interesting space between privilege and perception. And especially for me, one of the big role models and mentors in my life, my sort of go-to spiritual mentor, has been Amanda Kemp, who occasionally teaches here um, and who runs Theater for Transformation. And she's one of the people who really taught me that you shouldn't be afraid to say the wrong thing. You shouldn't let that keep you from speaking up. Um, so that was one of the things that I got from what Louise Stevenson said. But the other thing that, that she gave me was an idea for an experiment. And the experiment is that every once in a while, when students come into my office, I try to look at those students as though they were already my senior tenured colleagues and see how that feels. And um, whenever I've done that, that has been an incredible gift to me, um, especially. And I'm going to give you just two examples. There's a, there's a gazillion of them. But here's two examples. The first is um, A.J. Koi Koi, who graduated last year. He started in my calculus class as a freshman. And over the course of his four years here, majoring in Japanese and playing football and stuff, he became a role model and a mentor to my sons, who are pictured here with him, in really a way that I never could have. And I'm so grateful to him. Um, another example of that, of this, is um, that pro I'm not even going to say probably, definitely, the best ongoing professional development that I've had during the past decade has been working with my cohort of Booth Ferris advisees. Um, 
most of whom are pictured here. Go ahead and whoop, because you guys are great. Yeah, whoop. Um, pictured here are Anthony and Coleman Alamede, Avril, Michelle, and Andre, and not pictured here, but still very important, are Sheldon and Ephraim and Nadia. They were, they were a great group to work with. Um, I don't think students realize how very much their journey here to and through the college is like a faculty member's journey to and through the college. And to show how similar those are, my next couple of stories, I'm going to back way up to the beginning of my time here. Um, students, when they first come here, or first hear about f and often hear about f and because of an admissions recruiter. My admissions recruiter was actually a mathematician named Arnie Feldman, who's pictured here with his wife, Tracy. Arnie came and sit, sat down next to me at a math meeting and started telling me about f and um, One of the things he told me was that the math department had a glass elevator. I don't know if you think that your reasons for coming to f and might have been a little superficial, but I'm going to guess my glass elevator trounces your superficial reason. Um, when students first show up on campus for their tour, um, they get to often have an interview in the admissions office. And faculty who come here also get an interview with um, a whole bunch of people, including a group called the Professional Standards Committee. And I really remember my interview very well. I remember in particular one person, Professor Eigen from the Sociology Department. He asked me questions that were so penetrating and so insightful. They really made me hungry for a richer intellectual diet. He made me want to hold myself to a higher standard, and he made me want to hold the college to a higher standard. Um, that, that short little interview had such an effect on me that years later, when I came up for tenure, even though Joel Eigen was no longer on the committee, I wrote my research statement, imagining Joel Eigen reading it. And years beyond that, when the college started the house system, and we didn't know what we were doing, but I got to be one of the first house dons working alongside Joel Eigen. And I, the only way that I can describe how that feels is for those of you students who've been in a class with a professor you admire, and then all of a sudden you get to do independent study or research and you get to work side by side with them. That's sort of what I felt like. I felt like ooh, I'd arrived. Um, so I got the job, just like you, know, you got the acceptance letter. And then comes that waiting period, right? I'm not yet on campus. Um, did I make the right choice? A little bit of doubt. And into that space came a letter. Yours might have come from a house don or maybe an HA. Mine came from a computer scientist named Jay Anderson. And it, all he said was, you know, I'm really glad you're coming here. Please let me know if there's anything you want. It was a really simple letter. But 25 years later, I still remember how reassured that made me feel to know that I was coming to a warm and welcoming place. And it's possible that this trio of stories up here gives us a metaphor for what we would really like Franklin and Marshall to be at its best, which is sort of at its heart, this crunchy intellectual center. But it's surrounded by an atmosphere of warmth and welcoming and encouragement. OK, so I got the job. I came to campus. And what happens next? Well, for students, it's orientation. You know, we put an incredible amount of time and energy into orientation because we know that this really dramatically affects, this short little time period really dramatically affects how you see your whole time at FNM. And my orientation as a faculty member was no different. It massively shaped my career. I'm going to give you two examples to show that I'm not exaggerating. Um, at here at Franklin and Marshall, writing is really important, right? Your professors make you write a lot, you hope. And so we as faculty had an orientation to writing. One of the people who spoke in my faculty orientation on writing was Kirk Miller, a biologist. And he started talking about um, how the biology de department orchestrates its upper level, senior level writing requirement. I was really entranced by one aspect of that, sort of the, how he did the rubrics and the grading. And I took his idea and I molded it into a way that I could use with my calculus students. So I had my calculus doing students doing writing projects. And at the end of the year, I thought it was so successful that I wrote up a paper. This is the paper. It's called How to Grade 300 Mathematical Essays and Survive to Tell the Tale, which is what I actually did my first year here at f and Now, this is not a math research paper. It's a pedagogical paper. But it had an outsized influence on how the external mathematical community saw me. Um, 
years down the road, when I won that national teaching award, when I was appointed to advisory boards, when I was appointed to editorial boards, when I was named distinguished lecturers, there's all these things that happen outside. Every single one of those citations mentioned my work in mathematical writing, in particular, this paper that I wrote as a result of something that I learned on FNM's campus before I ever set foot in a classroom. Um, the second story of how orientation shaped my career is not quite as immediate, um, but it's no less dramatic. One of the things that we got to do on the tour is we got to take, um, uh, on orientations, we got to take a tour of the College Museum. This is Carol Fail, who was the director of the museum. And seeing these quilts here gave me the idea that I might use the symmetry groups from quilts to, uh, to illustrate some ideas that happen in an upper-level mathematics class called abstract algebra. It would probably be about 10 or 15 years before this interest in the mathematics of art switched into the mathematics of perspective art. But over the course of these 10 or 15 years, um, Carol Fail introduced me to a whole bunch of other people who became my friends and mentors and colleagues, including Carol Pearsall, who is a fabulous quilt artist, and um, also Bill Hudson, who's an internationally renowned um, abstract artist. So. Mm. I want to say thanks to Christopher Robb, who got me this picture of Carol Fail from the archives, and also one that will come later of Carol McCormick. Okay, so I've gone through orientation. I'm about ready to start my teaching and my classes. Um, one of the things that you should know about me is that I didn't look quite as distinguished then. I was only 26 years old. I was a single mom with a two-year-old kid. Um, this is what my family looked like in 1992. And so part of the reason that I could make it here at FNM, part of the reason I came, was because there was a daycare center, a child care center on campus. Back then it was in the, in the basement of what is now Brooks College House. And um, I, that was a great social engineering project on behalf of the college. Social engineering because not only did my daughter end up making a whole bunch of friends, this is a group of um, kids that we called the girly girls that hung out together and always wore pretty dresses. Um, but because she got to meet those friends, I got to meet her friend's parents. I got to meet people all over campus in a whole bunch of different departments. And so this was really a great exposure for a new faculty member to get to know people socially and, and professionally from all over. Um, one of these people I would have met anyway, which is Bob Gethner in the math department. Um, he looked different back then. This is what he looked like um, when I first met him. Um, Bob did an incredible kindness to me. When I came here, I decided that I was switching research fields, which as many people correctly warned me was a really risky thing to do because you're supposed to be publishing and so that you can get tenure. But I decided that I wanted to switch into something called chaos theory. So Bob, instead of just warning me that it was risky, decided to sit down and he read a book with me. This is Devaney's book, An Introduction to Chaos. Um, so we read this together and we got to, I guess it was like page two. And there's the definition of chaos, which Devaney des defines as having three parts. There's something and something else, and then something called transitivity. And um, Gethner asked me, I don't understand this thing about transitivity. And I thought, how ridiculous. That's the definition. Let's keep reading and get to the end where the research questions are so I can get tenure. And he says, no, no, no. I, like, I really don't understand why this trans trans transitivity thing. So I'm like, OK, I'll try to figure out why it would be this. So I tried to explain it to him. And he's like, no, 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 I don't understand. And I tried some more. And, he, and finally, I realized, no, this is actually a really good question there on page two. So at the end of the year, I wrote up a paper called The Role of Transitivity in Devaney's definition of chaos. This became my first research paper in my new field and actually became sort of the thrust of my research over the next decade. I really don't think I would have gotten tenure here at this college if it hadn't been for Gethner sitting down and reading with me and making me pay attention to the simple questions. And I'm incredibly grateful to him and also to the entire math department for all the incredible support that they've shown for me throughout my career. Okay, so I'm here on campus, I'm doing my teaching, I'm doing my research, this is great. And then there comes this sort of deciding point, right? For, for students, it comes when you sort of, you have to declare a major. For young faculty members, probably the equivalent is something called interim review. You've been here a couple of years and you say, here's what I've done so far and here's where I'm going from here. And um, it's like, it's terrifying. It was sort of personally 
um, a, a huge deal. Like, it wasn't just what, what do I want to do with my career. It made me think about what do I want to do outside of career? What do I want my whole life to look like? And I know a lot of my students who are choosing majors wonder that, right? This is, a, this is an identity crisis. For me, I was so grateful that I got to go through this identity crisis with a good friend of mine. Um, she stayed up late with me one night, and we drank unhealthy drinks. And, um, and we talked about what the future was going to look like. And nowadays, every time I see Dean Coleman come out with a new CD, or do a new performance, or open up a new venue, I think back to that day, that evening, many, many years ago, when we both shot our arrows off into the future, and how here we are, all these years later, watching those arrows come down, not really too far from where we aimed them. OK, so in term of you, what do students do next? Some, some students, juniors, go off on study abroad, and faculty get to do that too, right? What do, what do um, students do when they go on study abroad? You get to meet new people. You get to learn new things. Sometimes there's romance involved. Right, all of that was true for me. Um, so I got to meet Mark France in particular, who was, became my, my long-term co-author from then on in, in math and art and also in chaos theory. I also met up with my old high school boyfriend. Um, we just were trying to figure out whether we should get married, whether I should leave FNM and go to California, whether he should come here. But since that doesn't have anything to do with FNM, I'm going to leave those stories and come back. <laughs> to FNM with three, three more stories. Um, so far, most of the stories I've been telling you have been about how f the college changed my professional life. But these next three stories really have to do with how being at a small liberal arts college changed my personal life, sometimes because of academic reasons and sometimes not so much. So the first story is a not so much academic reason. I came back from my junior faculty leave and I ran into a guy named Neil, who I thought of in my head at that time as the husband of Carol Oster, a professor in the sociology department and one of those childcare parents that I knew. Right? So I asked him, how are things going? And it turns out I had one, I know this sounds scary, it's going to be a good story, I promise. Um, it, he's, it's, it turns out I had wandered into the middle of a soap opera. Okay? And pretty soon I became part of that soap opera. And to make a long story short, or to make an interesting story boring, um, two years later, I was married to Neil Gusman, and Carol Oster was now married to Professor Stan Mertzman in the Geosciences Department, and now my family looked like this. Okay, now the comedian Rita Rudner sometimes says, um, whenever I meet a man, I ask myself, is this the man I want to share custody of my children with? But even Rita Rudner didn't think about sharing custody with that man's next wife. Being the stepmother to Lauren and Lisa has been just a great joy in my life. And I'm really incredibly grateful to Carol Oster that she not only allowed me to be their stepmom, but she actually really welcomed and encouraged me to be a big part of their life. In this story, I want to fast forward to 2015, which is when the oldest of these girls, Lauren, got married. Um, my family had grown quite a bit by then. It looked like this. A couple of stepsons, uh, yeah, stepsons tossed in. Um, on that day, Lauren decided that she wanted to have all four of her parents walk her down the aisle. So there's me and Neil Gusman, Professor Carol Oster and Professor Stan Mertzman, walking Lauren down the aisle. Um, both Professors Oster and Mertzman have been awarded the Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching before. And for me, this is so much more meaningful because not only do I get to follow in their footsteps, but I get to walk side by side with them. So that's my first story, not particularly academic, but interesting, right? Good FNM trivia. <laughs> um, my second and third story have, have more of an academic component. I was, I was getting much more interested at this point in the idea of mathematics and art. And so I went to a talk by a professor named Linda Alechi. Um, I have to admit that at that time I was so clueless that I actually did not realize there was a difference between artists and art historians. Um, so Linda Leche was not actually talking about art, but she was talking about how her training as an art historian helped her to look at the world, the material world, and also the, the cultural constructs that we build. And in the course of this talk, she said this. She said, every person has a right to know where his or her food comes from. And I heard that and I thought, how ridiculous. I believe that there are certain rights that people have, right? We have the right to freedom from persecution and the right to free speech, but the right to know where your food comes from? 
But the more that I thought about this, the more this sort of translated into my own language, which is more comfortable with obligations than rights. And so now if you come to my house, you'll see things that look like this, which is food that I've gathered from local farmers and canned myself. Um, I don't know if there's a more striking example of a simple academic idea radically transforming a person's life than to say, nowadays, three meals a day, 365 days a year, when I sit down to eat, I think about questions of economics and environment and philosophy, moral versus right, rights versus obligations. I think about sociology and social justice, and even to hearken back to what Lisa Gasparoni said, I think about narrative, and I, because I often can and do tell people stories about where the food on my table came from. So that's my second story. My third, my final story, is really the most convoluted of all. And it starts with a book discussion group. Um, Tamara Gagline decided to organize a, an academic reading of the Old Testament. This is my copy that she had us all buy. Um, I don't know if she knows that every single time I see her, I think about this whole convoluted story and of how she changed my life. Um, it was a fantastic reading group. I got to lead, meet lots of really interesting people. But the two people who stuck out most in my mind for this were um, Carol McCormick and Stephen Cooper. Carol McCormick was a professor of anthropology, and Stephen Cooper was a professor of religious studies. And what happened almost every single week was this. Carol McCormick would come in and she would say, wow, this last story that we read is a really re interesting retelling of a story that you see across many cultures and across many times. And Stephen Cooper would immediately jump in and say, no, 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 when you read this book, you have to read this as a history of a particular people. It's self-contained. And she would say, no, when you read this story, you understand larger issues that affect the human narrative and affect us all. And he would say, no, 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 this book is written by a people for a people, and you have to understand that it's, it's, found, it's grounded in a particular place and a particular time. They went back and forth like this. I had never seen anything like that in all my experience. Um, you know, I'm a mathematician. I had taken a liberal arts college, and I had seen professors say, well, you could say this on the one hand, I could say that on the other hand, but I had never seen people who really fundamentally, like, staked out this position and cared about it. It was like this mini-series drama, and I just couldn't wait for the next installment. I loved that book discussion group. At the end of the semester, unfortunately, Carol McCormick suffered a stroke, and four days later, she passed away. And even though I didn't know her particularly well before that, I went to her memorial service because she had made a big impression on me. And at this memorial service, person after person stood up to talk about what great work she had done. And in particular, one of the things that they talked about over and over was her work with the Hospice of Lancaster County. So I decided, you know, if somebody's going to live on beyond themselves using her narrative, somebody's got to pick up from where she is. So I decided I was going to become a volunteer with Hospice. Now, I want you to remember that in my head, I'm still holding Tamara Gagline accountable for all the stuff that's happening, right? That I'm, okay, becoming a volunteer. So, I went to become a volunteer, and I had lots of different patients over the years. But one of my patients was a relatively young woman um, who had terminal cancer. And what she wanted help with was taking care of her highly rambunctious but incredibly adorable six-year-old daughter named Kirsten. Um, my family fell in love with Kirsten. This was right about the time we were getting ready to adopt our first son, Nigel. Isn't he cute? Yeah. Um, and when Dini passed away, which was when Kirsten was eight, our family stayed in touch with Kirsten over the years in a whole variety of ways, um, including when Kirsten was 18 and we adopted Jakari, um, we, had in, we hired Kirsten to come over and help take care of our boys after school, help them with their homework. And then a couple years later, when Kirsten was 23, we adopted Kirsten. Um, here she is with her parents and some of her brothers and sisters and my granddaughter, Elise, who's running around back there. I think we all know what it's like to sort of, you see a, uh, something romantic like a proposal and you get all teary-eyed about this. So you might imagine what it would feel like to have this child who you've loved 
and watched over and cared for for 17 years say, I love you, I want you to be my mom. But the question that I have for Tamara Gagline and for Stephen Cooper and for you all is this. Is this last story that I have told about a book discussion that leads into volunteer work, that leads into changing my, my family's life, is this just my own story, the story of me and my family? Or is this really an interesting retelling of the larger story we all want to tell about the liberal arts? The story of how a life of curiosity, of what Kriml calls the capacity and inclination for rational inquiry, transforms us so that our intellectual endeavors move into the realm of social activity in ways that profoundly affect our own lives and the lives of those around us. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that being at FNM has really changed the way that I look at the world. And in gratitude for that, what I would like to do is to do the same for you. So now we're going to switch gears, and I want to talk about the mathematics of art. All right. When I first, oh, excuse me, I'm going to get some water. When I first started teaching courses in the math of art, I really thought that um, everybody's scared of math, right? Everybody likes art. So by teaching courses in the math of art, I would use art to suck people into the math. And what I didn't realize was that I actually had it exactly backwards, that most of the students who come into my class had a math class last year, but most of my students have not had an art class since they were in sixth grade. So they draw like little kids, they're terrified, right? If I asked you right now to draw somebody near you or a chair near you, you would be scared. And just to show you how bad my students are, I'm gonna actually show you pretty typical examples of what it looks like when my first students first come into my class. This was Tim. Um, he was very embarrassed when I put this picture up on the wall. I put everybody's pictures up on the wall. Um, right? He looks like a little kid. Um, students of mine who are really interested in the arts, like Sid, who wanted to become a film director. Actually, nowadays, Sid is a film director. Right? He's, his pictures are so bad that he has to label everything. Like, do you see this right here is an object? <laughs> right? Thank you, Sid. That's really good. And even the students who you think of, like, the overachievers, what? Um, Kara Kramer, who was a Rouse scholar, this was her first picture. This actually it was her second draft of her first picture. You can see she's trying so hard to get the sense of three-dimensionality, the sense of depth, and she just can't. It's really frustrating if you don't know what to do. So I'm not an artist. I don't teach an art class. I teach a math class. But nonetheless, by the end of the semester, my students draw differently. So here's the same three students. And I'm not just picking on them. This is, this is really, this is typical of all my students. So Tim, my student who was embarrassed at the beginning of the semester, was he embarrassed at the end? No. This was his final picture. As a matter of fact, like many of my students, he turned the picture and then he came back and he's like, Dr. Cornell, can I take that back and photocopy it? I want to show my parents. Right? My, my students never want to photocopy their calculus exams. <laughs> right? um, what about Sid? Was he still labeling things? Well, yes, but now it was out of a sense of pride. Right? This is my building. It looks really good. And Kara Kramer, did she manage to master a sense of space? Yes, she did. Right? Many of you recognize this. This is her house, right? Bonchek College House. She apologized that the number of windows wasn't correct. That's, it, it's good. So I claim that this is a math course, right? It looks like art. Is it math? And I say it is math. There's a, there's a couple of problems that my students have to solve along the way. So for example, Kara had to solve these problems. These angles here in the pictures, they all look like the angles on a building that has 90 degrees, but the angles in the pictures are not 90. So how did she know how to do that? Or when Sid was drawing those towers in the middle, he was showing off, he's saying, I know how to put those towers in the middle. But how did he know? It looks right to you, but remember they weren't there when he was drawing them. You see also that there's a lot of lines. If my students are going to get an A on their final project, they have to have at least 600 lines. And yes, I count. Okay. So how do they know where all those lines go in the right place? And here's an example of what I mean by the right place. Right? That sidewalk going back into the distance is deliberate. It really adds the sense of depth. So how did he know how to space those sidewalk tiles? Those are really good questions, and I'm not going to answer those today. What I really want today, what we're going to look at is this somewhat more simple question, which is, did Albrecht Durer draw a square? So this is, Albrecht Durer is one of my very favorite artists of all time. He did this, he did this particular picture 502 years ago, St. Jerome and his study. Um, and it's, right, it's a gorgeous picture. And the question about whether this tabletop is a square, 
is an interesting one because um, in 1938, the director, the curator of prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, William Evans, who was a very influential guy, wrote a book called On the Rationalization of Sight. It was a highly influential book, it's still in print today. And in this book, Evans basically said Durr was an idiot and didn't know what he was doing. To me, that's fighting words, okay? So, and in particular, what he said in this long screed against Durr is this thing in the middle, the top of the saint's table is the oddest trapezoidal shape. Certainly, it's not a rectangle. Now, if you're looking at this, you might think, well, I don't know, that looks pretty good to me. So the question is, is Durr right? And if he's right, why could a smart guy like Ivins be wrong? And is Ivins wrong? And if so, how did a smart guy like Durer get it wrong? So that's what we're going to look at. Um, so this question, is that really that tabletop the image of a rectangle? Um, if this looks sort of good to you and you want a, a weirder kind of a challenge, you can look at what's on the back, the shape on the back, and say, what shape is that supposed to be? Is that supposed to be some kind of a rectangular object or a tilted object? And if it's like a rectangular object, then is it really like, um, like a tractor trailer or a dumpster going back into the distance? Is it really long? Or could it even be a cube? Right? What, what shape is that thing? I want to make you think it's actually a cube. That's what we're going to talk about at the end. Okay, so, but in order to understand these questions, we have to understand a mathematical and artistic notion called perspective. Perspective literally means through the window. Per is through, and spective is like spectacles, it's glass. The idea here is that you've got these objects out in the real world, like here's the bird's beak, and there's these light rays that go zing to your eye, right? And a light ray, it's a line, so mathematicians love it because they're geometrical objects. Um, if you put a window, which is like a canvas in the middle, the window is a plane, and it's a mathematical, fact of living in three dimensions that a line and a plane usually intersect in a point. So where that point is on the canvas, you can put a little bob of paint that matches the bird's beak, right? And here's another ray of light zing through, there's another little blob of paint. And the idea of perspective is if you do this with all the light rays that are coming to your eyes, you've got blobs of paint all over the canvas, then eventually what you could do is you could take away the real world, leave the canvas there, and as long as the artist this is weird, I know, but as long as the artist stands there with one eye looking at this picture and does not move, the artist will not realize that the world is gone. The picture lines up exactly with the outside. That's the idea of perspective. So I want to look at like rectangles. So I'm going to imagine that my artist is looking at a towel that's on a floor that's a rectangular towel. So here's my artist. Like Sid, I'm going to label things. This is not a fish. This is... Um, my artist is Kara, because I actually did it. This is from a photograph of Kara Kramer. So, um, this is her ponytail, her ears, and because I can't tell my left from my right, instead of having her look out of her eye, I'm going to have her look out of her nose. Okay, so we're looking at this towel here, and so here's the towel, and there's the image of the corners of the towel, there's the towel, there's the image of the corners of the towel on the window. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, in projective geometry, we don't like line segments, we want whole lines, so I'm going to extend the lines of the towels out to go on forever and ever, because that's happier for math land. And I'm going to say something that sounds really obvious, which means it's going to be deep in just a moment, okay? And the obvious thing that I'm going to say is, if you look at something, you can see it, and if you don't look at it, you can't see it. And here's what I mean in this picture. Let's look at this side view right here. If Kara looks along this line down here, she sees it, and so she's going to draw it here on the canvas. But if she's looking up, she can't see it, so she doesn't draw the towel here on the canvas. So somehow she's drawing these points that go up higher and higher, but they never get up here. At some point, these points, which is the image of this beach towel, have to stop. Where do they stop? Well, there's a math word that starts with P that tells you where you're looking, that goes out here. Does anybody know? I'm so used to interactive classes. Does anybody know the math word about, like, when you look out here and your line of sight doesn't intersect this other line? That's what happens in my classes, too. Can somebody actually say it? Right, okay, I'll pretend. Parallel, yes. If you're looking parallel, to the original line, then you can't see the line because your line of sight is parallel to the original line, so, so you can't see it. In other words, if the artist is looking parallel to some object in the real world, she can't see it, so the object vanishes there. That is the origin of the artist's vanishing point. Okay, so here we have this one line, we have one vanishing point. Here we have four lines. Do we have four vanishing points? Well, no, because if Kara is looking parallel to this line, right, then she can't see it. But she's also looking parallel to this line at the same time, because these lines are parallel. It's something called transitivity. So, right, so here she can't see this. So this is the vanishing point for this line and this line, because when she's looking at this point, she's looking parallel to both of them. So that's a vanishing point. 
And vanishing points are actually really helpful in analyzing pictures. So let's look at Albrecht Dürer's picture. If you look at this, you'll see that there's a bunch of lines in the picture that are vertical. They represent things that are vertical in the real world. And there's a bunch of lines like the, the, the base of the stair and some girders up here, the rafters up here, um, that, are, that are horizontal, and they represent things that are horizontal in the real world. But the bench, oh, I'm sorry, the bench is probably not going up, but, the lot, but in the picture, it seems to be going up. And the rafters on the, on the ceiling are probably not going down, but in the picture, they're going down. And so you, if you extend all those lines out, you'll see they all come over here to this side. So they, they're about half, they all extend to a point. The point is about halfway up the picture, and it's over on one side of the picture. Right? That's important because it doesn't just tell us something about the picture. It also tells us something about where the artist stands. Because if you think about it, right, if I'm looking parallel to, that, to this line here, and I have to look through this point, then I have to be halfway up the picture. Right? And if this point is off over to one side, and when I look at that point, I'm looking parallel to the edge of the square, then I have to be over on this side, and not in the middle of the picture. And that is a clue to this question of, is this a square or not? Because what happens if you look at it from the middle of the picture? Well, you see something weird, right? If you're in the middle of a table, you can't see the sides of it, unless the table is a weird table that has the sides at an angle. And that is part of why Ivins was saying, this looks like a trapezoidal table. It looks like a, a parallelogram, because he was standing in the middle, and he's well-trained. He knows what a table looks like, and he knows you can only see the sides if you're looking there. So one of the things this says is, if you're looking at a picture like this, you don't do what the tourists do and stand in the middle, you move over to one side, you hold it on this edge. And in fact, when Durer did this original piece, it was in a book and it was on the left-hand side of the book. So you open it up, you're over on this side. But there's more that you could ask. You could say, well, okay, I know I'm supposed to be over on this side, but how far away am I supposed to be? Like really close, really far? Does that, or does it even make a difference? And I'm gonna say it does make a difference. So I'm gonna do a little bit of geometry here with you guys because I'm a mathematician. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a crazy little line across the top, this diagonal line across the top of this table. Up here, the, top, the, the line would go here. Does that make sense? OK. This line right here is not parallel to the picture plane, so it has a vanishing point. right? It vanishes when we're not looking at it, and we're not looking at it when we're looking parallel to it. right? If my artist is looking parallel to that diagonal line, it's going to have a vanishing point. And here, since the diagonal line is a horizontal diagonal line, you can see that the vanishing point is going to be on the same level as the first vanishing point. And I'm just going to show you where that vanishing point is on the picture so you can actually see it. So imagine that you're drawing a diagonal line across the top of that table. Right? You've got a picture here. And you can see that the vanishing point would happen here on the horizon, right over here in the middle of the windows. Okay? So how does that help us understand what's going on? Well, geometry. Yay for geometry. Um, so I want to show you something really interesting about this picture to me. Maybe it's not interesting to you. See this triangle here? If this table that Durer was trying to draw is really a square, then this triangle is the best triangle in all of math because it's an isosceles right triangle, right? It's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. This, these two sides are the same. This is the best triangle in all of math. Okay? And there's more of those in this picture, because here's another isosceles right triangle. But do you see that there's a third isosceles right triangle? Right? There's one more 45, 45, 90 triangle. In fact, it's right here. Right? This distance here has to be the same as this distance here, because the orange lines are parallel and the green lines are parallel. Right? And what that means is that this distance here on the canvas, which I just showed you, is supposed to be the same as the distance that the artist is to the picture. So in other words, if you're looking at this picture, you don't want to be down where you guys are. You want to be straight ahead from this point, and you want to be out here about that far away. So you want to be on a ladder up here. And the college lawyers will not let me put a ladder up here on the stage and have everybody tramp and come across here. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to try this together right now. What I want you to do is you're going to take your picture, hold it, but move it over so that you're looking sort of at that dresser here on the side. And then pull it in until you're about, this distance is about six or seven inches. So pull it in until about six or seven inches. And then look at this picture. And I don't know if this works for you, but for me, this looks so much more three-dimensional. I love rolling my eye up and looking at that gourd. Isn't that amazing? Does it look 3D? OK. If you didn't think that was cool, I want to do the, the tractor trailer dumpster cube thing. Right? You look at this thing and you think, my gosh, there's no way 
that this thing could ever look like a cube, right? It's clearly a tractor-trailer dumpster. But if you imagine this eyeball is, is your eyeball. You want to be about this, this X, this, about this far away. So if you put your eye in front of this eyeball and bring it in almost so that your nose touches and then roll your eye down and look, what does it become? That's what I wanted you to say. Isn't that cool? It's a cube. Oh my gosh. And then you pull it away. No, it's a tractor trailer. It's a cube. Right? Who needs an iPod? You can just, whoa. That's so cool. Right? Oh, sorry, I'll do that again so you can take a picture. Oh, yeah. Really neat. This is one of the reasons why I, as a mathematician, think that you ought to go to museums. And the reason is this. Imagine you get to see something like Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin, right? It's eight feet tall. It's a huge picture. And the viewing distance for this, the Virgin is married in a tiled courtyard because back when they discovered perspective, everything was in a tiled courtyard because that adds perspective, right? So, the viewing distance for this is eight feet. So you stand eight feet back from this massive picture and you go, wow, I feel like I'm in this place, right? Now, if you don't get to go see it in person and you can only see it in a book where it's shrunk down to eight inches, then how far away are you supposed to be from this picture to make it look good, right? To make it look 3D, you have to be eight inches. That's uncomfortable. And in art history books, it's actually really hard to have all your pictures being eight inches tall. Most of them are like three inches tall. So if you see this in a, in a book and it's three inches tall, how close are you supposed to be to make it look three inches? Right? At my age, you can't even focus at that distance. So you need to go to museums to see pictures how they look. Not only to stand in the right perspective place, but also so that you get a sense of overall composition and so that you can see the brush stroke up really close. So go to see museums. So the question to this about Albrecht Durer versus versus William Ivins. In some sense, Albrecht Durer made a psychological mistake. He made the viewing distance so close that few people get to appreciate it. But William Ivins was wrong. Durer really did know his geometry. He knew it really well. And Ivins not only, unfortunately, maligned a great artist, but he also deprived himself of a really amazing experience of seeing art really leap into life in a way that he never would have been able to see it otherwise. So, I have three conclusions for this talk that I'm hoping you will take away with you, and also a little bit of water. We're cleaning the stage, it's good. Um, the first conclusion is this. Perspective art isn't just for artists. It's based on some simple math that leads to really good, tricky problems. How do you draw those 90-degree angles? How do you draw a square? The second conclusion that I want to bring to you is that active perspective viewing isn't just about what Albrecht Durer did 502 years ago. It's about what you do when you open your next art history book or you decide to go to a museum or you look at your vacation photos and you look at them from here or up here. Right? But the third and probably the most important conclusion we have is this. Sometimes we need to get close to something to see it the way that it's really meant to be seen. Thank you very much. Lisa, uh, Pablo Hennigan Biology. Uh, that was very eye-opening in many ways. The question is, so are museums aware of this? I've been to all kinds of museums, from the lowliest to the Louvre, and I've never seen an X on the floor that says, to look at the picture, you need to stand right here. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, do artists and curators know about this? I have heard rumors that there are, in places in Italy, um, places that say, stand at this X. Um, most, so we, Mark France and I actually ran a series of workshops for artists and mathematicians set six or seven years of those, um, and we had like a hundred people come through, and almost every, well basically every single artist who ever came in said, I, I never knew this, I never knew how to look at a painting before. This is not something people know. Um, when, when we went to museums ourselves, so, like I just went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and there's pictures that are hung way too high. You can't see, you can't see them, because you'd have to be on a ladder. Um, there's pictures that are hung very low. My colleague, Mark France, when he went to the Indianapolis Museum, had all of his um, workshop participants down there on one knee, and the curator came over and said, what are you doing? And they explained that the viewpoint was really low, and the curator actually ended up rehanging this. But my impression is that most curators do not know about this. Virginia Maximowitz, Professor of Studio Art. I can tell you how you've had an influence on me 
uh, through a very good story. Um, being much more aware now of this distance thing with art, my husband and I manage with oh, maybe five years of trying to get into the Pauline Chapel, which is the chapel next to the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. It's not open to the public, it's Pope's private chapel. But somehow we did it, all right? And the reason I wanted to do it is because um, on t it's a very long, narrow chapel. And two sides have Michelangelo's last frescoes. In every art history book, the image of these long frescoes is from across the room, and it's one big, long thing. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many art historians have looked at that and said, ah, Michelangelo was old, he wasn't at the top of his game. Uh, look how distorted this stuff looks. And I did read one article on JSTOR by a Professor Wright who questioned this. I thought, I gotta get in and look. I can't believe Michelangelo wasn't at the top of his game, even as an old man. When we got in, long, narrow chapel, seats facing this way, that's how everybody would be. They wouldn't be across the room. And in fact, all of those photographs from across the room were taken with a wide-angle lens, and the lens itself distorts, right? Mm -hmm. And we were in there with the head restorer, and he let us go up on the altar to see what the Pope sees. Mm. You get there, perspective is perfect, because you're really looking at an odd angle. It's not just a matter of a canvas and being off to the right. Mm -hmm. You're looking peripheral vision. Wow. And cool. Boy, it works. That's great. So you got to get in. Okay. Cool. <laughs> See you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So the next question that somebody needs to ask is, Dr. Cornell, what are you most proud of, and what do you think your legacy at the college will be? Could, <laughs> okay. So that question. So <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad you asked. Um, when we started the house system, one of the big questions was, do we build kitchens and dining halls for every single house? We decided that would be way too expensive, but our visits to other um, institutions convinced us that breakfasts would actually be a really good idea. It turns out that um, bringing in breakfast f through Sodexo or whoever was doing it at the time would have been way too expensive. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go across the street to the bagel shop and I'm going to get bagels. So my house was the first house to have bagels. And then the other dons are like, wait, where did you get the bagels? And I'm like, I went across the street, I got bagels. So this is my lasting legacy to Franklin and Marshall. I started the bagel breakfast. That was me. Thank you. Thank you. And I want that to go in the history books. So. Thanks. Hi, I'm Raven. I have class with your husband. Uh, or did, Russian, but um, talking about food and where it comes from, um, I was wondering, and I know you're not a soc professor, I'm a sociology major, but um, how do we combat food security and things like that? You know, because it does come at a price being able to go to Central Market and buy fresh food. You know, and here as students, we're kind of stuck and, you know, chained to Sodexo, so how do we become conscious consumers <laughs> If, I mean, really, we're, yeah, but, um, yeah, how do we make choices when I feel like I'm kind of stuck with, you know, this box of, of food? Yeah, that's a really good question, and by the way, I wanted to say thanks to my cohort for teaching me about the snapping. I never knew about that before, so that's you guys. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so the thing about, well, food security for students who are stuck here at FNM and food security elsewhere are two really different issues because you, you're only here for a little while and you've got this weird contract. Um, and I would say, like, you just keep practicing. That, for me, learning how to get food from different sources is like what Boots and Miles told me, right? I thought it was impossible and I just kept practicing the impossible and now I know, like, how to get milk with no carton, you know, and, and, and local milk and how to get local hamburger and I'm still looking for chicken but I'll find it someday, right? Um, the, the bigger question is really not a question of how do we grow all our own food, but how do we redistribute it? Um, I try very hard to throw away a little amount of trash, but every Friday when I go to Water Street, I throw away tons and tons and tons of food. Um, the redistribution is just really the, the big question, and it's not something that little old me can answer, but I think it's a big societal question. Yeah. 
I see the stop sign. Thank you guys so much for a really wonderful talk. It's been great having you.